It's time to make it Just give it a try Cause you can make it Like the old fat guy Welcome to today's show on You Can Make It. I'm David Farrell, the old fat guy. Today I'm going to make something I really like. It's corned beef. Now, you can go to a store and buy a corned beef already cured and just ready to cook. And later on, I'll show you how I cook one of those prepared corned beefs. But why not make it all yourself, right from scratch? Buy the meat, cure it yourself, put it in a brine, and then cook it. And the reason to do that extra work is it just tastes so much better, I can't begin to describe it. It has a better texture, more flavor, and you know what's in it. Now, a thing about making corned beef is it's cured, which means nitrates are added to it, just like bacon and hams and pastrami's and all that kind of thing. That's why it has the brilliant red color. But nitrates are a double-edged sword. If you use too much, they're bad for you, and if you don't use enough, it doesn't preserve the meat so that it gets those good colors. And to do it and get the appropriate cure, you use a product called Prog Powder Number no. 1. It's also known as Pink Salt Number no. 1 or Instacure Number no. 1 or a whole variety of names. But what you need to know is that the product must contain 6.25% sodium nitrate and 93.75% salt. Make sure it has those ingredients. And when you buy some, don't use it for anything else too much nitrites are bad for you. So get yourself some pink salt. You can get it online or at butcher supply stores. That is what cures the meat. Now I've chosen to get a what they call a whole packer brisket to do my corned beef. Briskets can be hard to find. You can make a decent corned beef with outside round roast, but it'll be way leaner. It won't have the nice fatty texture of making it from a brisket. Now, when you buy a whole brisket, you have a couple of things you need to know. First is that it has a lot of fat on the surface of it. You can see big, thick layers of fat, most likely more than you want. And, it, and a full packer brisket is divided into two points, or two parts, rather. There's a flat, which has the meat running this way, and there's the point, which is this pointy part that sticks up. This is fattier than this. And if you go to the old-time delis and you ordered fat corned beef, it would come from this. I've got a missus who most likely will be happier if I don't do that. So I'm not actually going to turn the point part or the fatty part into corned beef. I'm going to be making something else out of that later. So I've got to cut that off. I like to start off preparing my brisket by cutting off the thickest parts of the fat. You want to get it down to about a quarter to a half inch of fat. So just start slicing fat off of the surface and keep going down until you get it to the thickness you want. Now if you like a lot of fat, leave more fat on it. It's totally up to you, but I'm going to take it down to about a quarter of an inch. And it's pretty thick in there too, so I'm going to cut some of this off. And some off of there. And we'll feel around, it's pretty thick around there too, so we'll do some cutting along there. And don't worry about it being a little ragged. By the time you slice it, nobody will notice. Now that's pretty good. There's a little bit there more than I'd like. We'll just take a little bit of that off. But, and we'll get this big knot of fat and cut it off. And that's that side pretty well done. We're down to about a quarter to a half an inch. So we'll just flip it over and see if there's any thick globs of fat on the other side. There's usually one right there that I like to take some of that out. So we'll just use a pointed knife to cut some of that piece of fat out. And then you'll notice along here there's usually a thick piece of fat that I like to cut down a bit. And 
and that's pretty good. That's a quarter to a half inch at the thickest parts. Now, on this side, there's also a big, nice piece of fat that I'll cut down. And there we go. Now, that's most of the fat taken off down to about where we want it. Now, to cut the point off, it's easy to note where it is because the meat runs in a different direction. And there's a layer of fat that runs right through like that. So don't worry about getting exactly on it. But if you can just sort of cut it off like that, you'll see there's the fat of your meat that they use for it. And I'm going to leave... Uh, Cut another slice off, just like this, and I'll be able to use those for some burnt ends I'm going to make. And you can see that that's a lot fattier cut of meat than this part over here. So there we have what's left is the flat of the brisket. And this is not going to fit in any kind of container to brine easily, so I'm just going to cut it in half. I really recommend you do this on a cutting board instead of a metal tray. It's a lot easier. There we go. Okay, so there's my two pieces of beef that I'm going to turn into corned beef. I just got to get set up to make my brine, and I'll be back in a minute. We have our meat all trimmed up, and now we have to make a brine for it. The thing about making a brine for curing meat is you have to calculate the ingredients you're going to be using in the brine based on the weight of both the meat and the water, the total weight of the two. The reason for that is you're trying to get a certain level of parts per million of, say, the nitrites in the meat, which means that you have to have enough nitrites in that the water and the meat will slowly even out and get the same amount. But if you have more water, you need more nitrites. So it's important you know the weight of both. Now, I weighed my meat, and it weighs 3.2 kilograms. Unfortunately, my scale isn't big enough to measure the meat and the water. So I put the meat into this container and I poured a measured amount of water over it. And it took three liters of water to cover the meat. Now I happen to know that one liter of water weighs one kilogram. So there is three kilograms of water, 3.2 kilograms of meat for a total of 6.2 kilograms of both. Now I'm going to take the meat out of the water because I'm going to be mixing some stuff into the water. go. Now, what I have to do is use the measures that I know for a set amount. So for each kilogram of water and meat, you need to use 60 milliliters of kosher salt, 21 milliliters of sugar, one half clove of garlic crushed, and 8.5 milliliters of pickling spice. In addition to that, you're going to use some of the prog powder number one or pink salt number one or whatever your brand is called. And you're going to use three grams to get it exactly right. If you don't have a little measure, you can get by with 2.5 milliliters per kilogram. So if you were making four kilograms, you'd multiply each of those numbers by four. Now, if you were back in the dark ages, you're an American. If you want to work in pounds, for each pound of water and meat, you would use two tablespoons of kosher salt two teaspoons of sugar, one quarter clove of garlic crushed, one teaspoon of pickling spice, and 0.048 ounces or one-fifth of a teaspoon of the pink salt. So I have the water here. Let's start adding the stuff to it. We'll start off with the kosher salt. Now I have 372 milliliters of kosher salt. That's 6.2 times 60. And I just add that into the water. Now you're going to think that's a lot of salt but corned beef basically was first invented to add tons of salt to it so it would last longer. 
And then we have 130 milliliters of sugar. And we're going to add th three cloves of crushed garlic and 52 milliliters of pickling spice. And we're not adding the pink salt at this time because we're going to cook this and pink salt goes better if you don't cook it. So I'm going to bring this up to a boil and then I'm going to let it simmer for 10 minutes. So just let me turn on my stove here. And we'll just bring this to a boil and as I say I'm going to let it simmer for 10 minutes. My brine cooled to room temperature and I added 18.6 grams or about 15 milliliters of pink salt or prog powder. And I'll give it a stir and let it get in it. And we're now ready to put the cure into our meat. We're going to start by injecting it. Now you could just put it in the brine and let it sit for 10 to 12 days, but by injecting it, you only have to let it sit for about seven days. So I like to inject. It gives a nice solid cure. So we're just going to move the brine aside. There we go. And we'll pull some with a meat injector and we'll just put it in every inch or so of the meat. You'll note that I put the meat on a tray so that any juice that comes out or through cracks or squirts out will fall on the tray and I can put it back in the marinating or brining container. And we'll just keep doing this every inch or so on both pieces of meat. Now when you get to a thinner part you might have to go in at an angle. That's just fine. And there's our meat all injected. Now, what we'll do is put the meat back into the brine. And pour any liquid in the tray over the brine. Now, you always have a tendency for the meat to kind of float up like this. And if you just take a little plate and push it down into the liquid so some of the liquid goes over, it helps hold it down. So now this is going to go in the refrigerator and I'm going to let it marinate in the brine for seven days and once every day or so I'll just flip the meat over just to make sure it gets a good coating. I'll see you in seven days. The brisket sat in the brine for seven days and now we're going to take it out because it should be cured. So we'll get rid of the plate we used to hold it down. And I just like to put it on a rack. And the first thing you'll notice is that it's quite firm. When you cure meat, it gets tighter and firms up a lot. So there we go. And don't worry if you've got a few of these peppercorns and that on it. They can be on it or come off. It doesn't matter. But what you want to do now is just pat it dry with some paper towel. You don't need to get it totally dry. You just don't want to be dripping while you're working. And this one. And now that it's kind of dry, I'm just going to move it to a cutting board because those are two pretty big pieces of corned beef. And Unless you've got a large family, you don't want to cook that much at once. So now's your chance to cut it into portion sizes that you like. So we'll just put the cutting board down and put one of these on top of it. And I'll get myself a knife. Now this is pretty big. About half of this would do my wife and myself for one cook. So we'll just cut this in half. And you can see the lovely, brilliant red color that you get in beef when you cure it. So I'm going to leave one of these out to be fresh. And I'm going to put the other one in a vacuum bag and freeze it for up to two months to have at a future date. And I'll cut the other one into two portions too. In a couple of days, I'm going to be cooking one of these. 
and I'll come back and show you how to cook your corned beef. We finished up our corned beef and now I want to cook a piece of it. Now at this point I'm using my homemade corned beef, but this is exactly the way I cook a chunk of corned beef I buy in the supermarket or anywhere else. It is the same method. The idea is you want to put the corned beef in water for a long period of time of cooking to one, make it tender, and two, draw some of the salt out of the corned beef. Remember what corned beef is. It is beef that they packed a lot of salt in in the old days so it would last longer, but it has a lot of salt in it. So you want to cook it in water for a long period of time. What better method of cooking something in water for a long period of time than your slow cooker? So what I've done is I've cut four uh, medium-sized potatoes into quarters and put them in my slow cooker. You'll note I didn't peel them. Most of the nutrition of a potato is near the skin. A lot of taste is near the skin. If you peel your potatoes, you're throwing away food. I just can't do it. So I have the potatoes in my slow cooker and I put them in the bottom. And now I'm just going to take the piece of corned beef, nice, beautiful piece of corned beef, and put it on top of the potatoes. Now, I want to add enough water to just cover it. There we go. And when you've got enough water to just cover it, now I like to add some seasonings. Because as long as you're boiling it for a long time, why not kick it up and add some more flavor? So we'll just have a look at my seasonings here. We have on this plate 1 8 teaspoon or 0.5 milliliters of each of the following. Ground ginger, ground mace, dill, dry dill weed, ground coriander, mustard seed, ground allspice, and ground cloves. Then we have 5 milliliters or 1 teaspoon of crushed chili flakes, 1 milliliter or 5 excuse me, 5 milliliters or 1 teaspoon of peppercorns, and just a pinch of cinnamon. Trust me, take it easy on the cinnamon. And we're just going to add those spices into the water and mix them around. There we go. So now that we've got the spices in the slow cooker, I'm just going to cover it up, set it on low, and it's going to cook for nine hours. I'll see you then. After eight hours, or one hour before the corned beef was cooked, I spread two cups of coarsely shredded cabbage over the top of the slow cooker and put the lid back on. The corned beef's been in the slow cooker for nine hours and the cabbage has been in it for an hour. So the first thing we're going to do is take the corned beef out of the broth. And we'll just we want it to sit for a while to firm up. So we're just going to put it on our cutting board and set it aside for a minute here. And then we want to take the potatoes and the cabbage out of the broth. So we'll just scoop them out with a slotted spoon here. Now, the reason that a lot of people cook potatoes with their uh, corned beef is the potatoes help cut salty taste. And there's no doubt that corned beef has a lot of salty taste. So corn, corned beef and potatoes and cabbage is a common dish. So we'll just get it all out into a bowl here. And now, I only cook my cabbage for the last hour, and in a slow cooker that means it comes out quite crisp. I just cannot abide really soft, flabby, flabby uh, cabbage. I like some crunch to it still, so that's what I have here. There we got most of the cabbage out. And we'll just set this aside and bring our corned beef back. Now, this piece of corned beef came off of the last little bit of the flat, so it had some of the point on top, and it's going to be quite fatty, but we can just cut that off. So let's just take a slice of our corned beef here. Look at that color. Isn't that beautiful? 
take another slice. And now, of course, we need to try a bit of it. So we'll just take a little bit of the corned beef and have a taste. Mmm. It is almost as tender as butter. It's got just a little bit of spice because I like to put some chili, uh, crushed chilies in my water. It's got wonderful herb flavor. It is so delicious, so rich, so succulent. This is a great corned beef, and the best part is you can make it. I have a good woman. I ain't good looking. But I do some cooking. I'm the old fat guy. So use that oven. If you want some loving, be like the old fat guy. Like the old fat guy.